love for uh, us and just your ongoing pre-planned thoughts that you had before time and just always uh, it just you know, <laughs> blows me away to think that you had everything planned out to know that each day each moment that uh, you wanted what's best for us and we experienced the things to get us to this point so we reflect now on everything that's happened in our world and how you have moved in our life and we're looking forward to what's going to happen yet and we see that finally there's a, a ceasefire temporarily amongst your people over there and we ask that you continue to give us uh, wisdom and insight to live the way we should live, understand and think and believe um, and the better things about your truth and your provision for our life. So thank you for just always being there as our loving Father. We just ask you with us now as we look to study your word, may you guide us and teach us and equip us and help us understand you want us to know and learn. So may you be our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, our counselor, our coming bridegroom. We ask all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So uh, today's lesson will be the continuation of Matthew 25, and as we do on Friday, to expound a little bit. Plus, I know that was a very, um, uh, how do you say, uh, I got not say touchy <laughs> subject, but it's a very involved subject matter because a lot of us, I think uh, Lainey once said it was the one that she got your teeth wet on. Uh, your teeth, is that right? Is that, I thought your teeth, I can't say that phrase right. <laughs> Was, anyway, I'm missing the phrase. I don't know. But you, you first got introduced to the kingdom thing, to the deep, deeper things of God's word through this parable. Um, anyway, so we're looking at the, the context to remind us. And the, one of the bigger things is that we find is that people, again, tend to think, and I had it, someone said it today. I forget who said it to me. But someone said to me on the phone today, they said, oh, I can't wait till the, the, you know, the coming of the Lord. Uh, I'm ready for him to come right now. And they say that. And remember, we talked about that. And now that's I did the same thing and have done it. We still kind of still do that. But when we, people say that, they mean rapture. But that's not <laughs> what you should say then. If you mean that, you should say that. But they don't say that all the time. They say the coming of the Lord, and they, they mean rapture, but they, which is part of the problem why people conflate the two terms together. Because there's a rapture, and then later on there's a, a, a coming of the Lord, a perusia, when he comes here on the white horse. And when he, his, his, coming, his second coming is not a pretty thing. It's going to be, well, he's beautiful, but it's going to be very horrific in the first seven months is a judgment time. And so that's one of the biggest differences in how people read the Olivet Discourse is they, they, they can gel things together. And oftentimes that's not obviously going to be healthy for you. So we already saw in, in Matthew 24 leading up to this quite a bit of different demarcations of how and why those things are different. So to remind us the reason why for anybody who's tuning in late or rem doesn't remember why are we now sticking in Matthew for a little while camping out and we're not going back to Mark and Luke when they also talked about the Olivet Discourse? Oh, and by the way, how can Luke actually in chapter 17 mention things that are similar to Matthew and you're ignoring that? I'm not ignoring that. It was done earlier in this teaching prior to his last week. We're going to get to that after we finish Matthew 25, just so you know. We are going to talk about Luke 12 and 17 that have dovetailed references to things that are similar, but at a different time frame, again, we're taught uh, and so that's uh, not the focus. The focus here, sorry, it freaked me out a little bit. It's all heard a noise. And so the reality is that in reference to why Matthew is the one we continue on with, because remember the, the three questions that were asked. There are not three questions asked in Mark and Luke, but there were in Matthew. So as we continue on the, the, the thought we looked at in Matthew 25, one of the things I didn't bring out that I wanted to make sure, I, 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 I thought it, but I didn't say it, and that is in Matthew 25 and verse 1 when he says the kingdom of the heavens. The first thing I want to stop and, and remind you of is it's commonplace for us who know what we know and understand what we understand to see that phrase and automatically know it's not heaven he's talking about. But that's not what major Christianity denominations teach. Matter of fact, I don't know of anybody outside of people that understand um, what we call kingdom, what scripture calls kingdom or word of the kingdom things or sticker to the kingdom of the, of the God. That's how scripture calls it and Mark 4 and Matthew 13, respectfully. So in lieu of that terminology God uses, the secret of the kingdom, they think that means, oh, the secret is that Christ is the Messiah. Oh, the secret is that, and you tell them, oh, come on, that's not a secret. That's pretty much foretold before time, and he pretty much made that clear. And they go, oh, no. Okay, what I meant was the secret is that even though they knew that, they didn't understand that the Jew and the Gentile become one new man. Not really. That's not really the secret. And they, and they go into, oh, the secret is that the law of Moses has been fulfilled by Christ. And they go through all these different things to try to posture to their defense. They don't know what else to make of it. So they make with the best they can with what they have. 
But we know that the kingdom of the heavens phrasing means something different. And again, I want to, uh, and if you haven't done this before, and for all of us you have, and I'm speaking to folks that maybe who hear me, I guess some folks have heard me teach on this issue, and they've asked me these questions. Like, hey, what are you talking about when you say kingdom of the heavens? Like, what do you mean? And I take it for granted, and that's on me, to I want to make sure I just do a little side note here to remind us that, and, and please do this, I'm not just saying this tongue in cheek, I mean this sincerely, because this is how it excited me, and this is how I got started on this issue years ago, back in 2008, I believe is when I did this, um, and in a different way, to just kind of go, huh? And I looked up the phrases where kingdom of God was used, and kingdom of heavens was used, and heaven, and I was alarmingly surprised that it wasn't all the same and how it was referenced and there was works involved obviously not just by grace through faith even though I know it's by grace through faith that you're saved and go to heaven if you will and so I'm going wait a second and then the old issue of why did God who's the author of language use different phrases to begin with was a big misnomer but not to mention why does everybody just congeal it all together and then with that study start looking up the way inheritance and entrance is mentioned in that context. So you do that, it kind of opens up a lot of different things. So in Matthew 25, when we say kingdom of the heavens, we already know there's an entrance before there's an inheritance in the heavenlies. Because that's what scripture says. You won't find kingdom of the heavens and inheritance kind of simultaneously mentioned in the same. Where you will find that is about the kingdom of God. You will not find that in kingdom of the heavens because it's talking about entrance because that precludes it. And so in chapter 25, when he says they are ten virgins, there's two things that I just want to make sure that, that, that technically speaking, or exegetically speaking, they are five foolish and five wise. Now five is a number for grace, and ten is God's ordinal completion. So why did he use five and five? He could have used, you know, seven, his complete number, and three. He could have done that, right? And he could have still, with the three, used a remnant and, and chose one of the three, right? Could have done that. But he didn't. He used five. Why? Why five? And I contend to you is because of the fact that when they're called to this meeting, when he says that they are compared to ten virgins who, having taken their lamps, went into a meeting, and that word went is an is extelon, which means they came out from, they have went out from. So he's talking about the grace, God's power and God's ability and God's might and choice to do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He gave these people during the middle of tribulation an exit out of a time which is horrific. So it's a very big deal. We talked about that in Thessalonians, which is why I want to also reference that to remind you that the reason why he used five is to show the grace he gave to these 60 fruit foolish, I mean 60 fruit wise and 30 fruit foolish and how they were brought out of, and not to mention before that, the 100 fruit even more uh, wise, the ultimate wise, faithful one, they were actually brought out of one before the old tribulation started, the faithful ones, the hundred fruit. But these 60 and 30, before things got really bad under the beast, when he's manifested as lawless one, and then later on as the opponent. So also keep in mind, go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 7, and as we're turning there, remind you that it's not a rapture passage. So as soon as I, 1 Thessalonians 4, I should say, I think it's 7. 1 Thessalonians 4, so when you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, people first think, as soon as you hear that reference in Scripture, everybody gets excited. And they go, oh my gosh, it's the rapture. We're going to talk about the rapture today, you know? Or everybody goes, I can't wait to 1 Thessalonians 4 comes about. A little break because everybody knows who's known about eschatology thinks that that's the rapture thing. So when you look at 1 Thessalonians 4 to remind us of the study, just, just one verse to remind you of. In verse 7, when he said, that we the living who are left over in the same time with them will be caught away in the clouds for a meeting of the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. So you got to remember that this is a time at the end of the tribulation period. It's at the end of that time where wave four of the soon Medicoi who are the 144 on Mount Zion are called up. So why am I bringing this up in Matthew 25 reference? Because they're going into a meeting is what it says in Matthew 25, verse 1. And in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 17, they were called up in the air into a meeting, if you remember. And they were coming to that meeting later. That's why they came from the west and from the east, right? They came from a different direction, but they came to the meeting a little later, but they still came to the Ariston. And that's all I want to make sure we understood. So these, this meeting that's taking place and 
Matthew 25, verse 1, is actually the meeting of them being raptured in wave 2 and in wave 3, or the middle of tribulation period. They're being caught up. And so they are in this situation. That's why it says the word extelon means to leave out from. They're left out from earth and were transferred to heaven. All right? So when that being the case, the, the thought here is later on when they were, they were going there, because remember, you're betrothed, and then you have this waiting period. Uh, and then right now we're in the waiting period. Then you have a, you're transferred to the Ariston to await the appearance of the bridegroom. So when they went to this meeting, this verse 1, that was the transfer. So people sometimes always um, get things a little bit differently. There's two waiting realities. There's a waiting period proper, but then you're transferred to, as, a, as a, what the father would do is he would, he would make it home for the, the, the bride and groom, and then the, they, they'd be waiting while he was doing that. And then when he fi finished the, the home, the bride went there, went there first. The, the bride and the maiden went there first and the bridegroom came in last. Unlike Western culture, which is really odd, we make the bride the whole thing. And, and that's not the way that the bridegroom came in last, which is kind of hard for us to grasp because it's always the grooms up there. I don't know if you <laughs> remember getting married, because I know I sure do, and I always make fun of the fact that for me it was like, ling a ling a ling, and I came in. And that was it. Like, no one stood up, like nothing. I just walked in the side door, I don't forget, it wasn't down and out, no, nope. I walked right from the side <coughs> door to a ring-a-ling-a-ling -a -ling with my best man, and that was it. And the pastor came out with us, and we're like, <whistles> and then all of a sudden, the big, gigantic organ played in a 5,000-seated seat church, and it was massively large and awesome, and there comes babes down the aisle with, I didn't know at the time, her father. Pretty awesome sight, because it was, it was awesome on many levels, so I was like, wow. But that's co it's cool with me, but I don't forget it. It was like a big, everybody stood up, all rise, and they all looked back, you know, and she walks by. And they didn't do that for me. <laughs> so it's interesting, in our culture, the bride's the focal point, which is cool. But back in the day, the bridegroom was the one everybody was waiting on. Oh, have you seen him? Have you seen him? So the bride was transferred with the bride maidens. The bride was made a big deal by her maidens because she was doted on. She was, she was all, you know, cared for. So it, that's why you don't, people ask me the question sometimes, well, how come the hundred fruit person, the, the proper betrothed bride, is not in view in the Matthew 25 virgins parable? Because she's not the issue. The ones who dote on her are, which is the 60 and 30 fruit, the wise and foolish people, if all this is making sense. So when they are being transferred here and, and are waiting for him to come in, the, the verse 4 uh, and three, 3 and 4, excuse me, when it says they, remember they didn't take the oil, we talked about that. So when they didn't have oil, someone asked me, well, what is, what is the oil? To remind you, the, the other, so the exegetical piece of the five is representing the grace, is just technically correct, and the two groups of this that had grace from God to ordainly complete his enters into the heavenlies, which are the 60 and 30 fruit yields, which later on then he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Another group was then called up to, with that meeting in the air from a different direction. So we go, okay, so then, okay, so, but could, and this is just, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying this is what this means, because it, it doesn't mean this, but a extrapolation from this could be also that during this Ariston time, it could be, because people have asked me this a lot, they say, hey, what if I'm married to somebody uh, and they're of a different level spiritually than me? And they say, well, hey, do we get just imputed the one to the other and that kind of thing? And that's been a, a thing that's gone on for the longest time, right? So what, what if... What if the reason that God did this parable was to also ancillarily, not primarily, but ancillarily, to give you the idea that, you know what, um, there's going to be a time if you, that you can actually share and actually gain knowledge. So for those, whether or not you think the foolish virgin represent the one who's a lower spiritual level or not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the principle is clear. There is an opportunity for some of these foolish to go down to those who market and come back with enough to enter in. So... So folks who get all kind of like maybe, oh my gosh, you know, my spouse so-and-so isn't the same as me, so I'm concerned, or I don't wanna, I'm don't i not going to make it in the same so-and-so. Well, hey, look, you know, the good news is that if you have uh, the right oil going in, then you're going to have the opportunity to obviously grow. If you don't have enough oil, you have another chance to do that near the end. So God affords opportunities to you, so it isn't like it's over when you get there, and if you think that you're not you know, measure it up. So I wouldn't sell yourself short. 
and never give that sense of defeat mindset. Just always think positively and a a sense of opportunity that God's love and provision will be enough for you. Just focus on that and be grateful. So the whole point about what the oil is, remember, again, it comes from the olive tree. And I mentioned that before. So somebody said, what's the oil? And so Holy Spirit, again, is the referencing to the first measure. The first time we see oil in the scripture, referencing to the to the tabernacle uh, was in reference to the oil and the and the and the lamp which is hidden behind here but to remind you this is the lamp from which the center the center had the oil and then they would these other ones were not lit they only had, they had enough only for one one day left and then they went to go in Hanukkah to go get some oil if you remember remember in the Han- the Hasmanian dynasty in about 167 BC so they only had one measure of oil left, but yet it, it was enough to light for all of this, for eight days. And that's why they got the nine candelabra from the seven. So the reality is they only had enough for the one day and it lasted eight days. They're like, how, how, how's that work? So they, they really they added another, they added one on each side. So the, the difference is that that spirit of God was represented by the menorah, that his spirit would never leave them. He would always be present with them. And that's why the menorah to them was a big deal. If it goes out, then God's not with us. And so it was like a, it was a symbolism of his presence. And so it's hard to explain that to people that don't understand. It's almost like, um, I don't know, some people think it's foolish sometimes to put a lot of weight into a wedding ring. But all of a sudden, you know, and, but when it's your wedding ring that you lose, that maybe came from grandma that was given to the one you love, it, it, then all of a sudden it resonates with you, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not funny, right? So this is the menorah to the Jewish people. So the, the menorah was a representation of God's spirit. And they got the seven spirits of Christ, which he was the, God, he was the Godhead dwelt, dwelt bodily in him. Uh, you have all, this, all these different things that come out of the oil, the, the olive oil, that which in the menorah, which was the presence of God's spirit, was, was, was represented in how they had an extra measure of oil, which was olive oil, which they took with them, which means from the beginning of their understanding. In other words, Understand what I said before last week. I didn't emphasize this enough, but last week I mentioned to you how they took it took a long width, which means that they when they took of the understanding of the scripture, they took with it the extra measure. It wasn't like they just took the, the truth of the information, which a lot of people do, and they discount what the accountability is to it. That that's not cool. You can do that. Not cool. And it's not good for you. So you think it's funny, that's 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 on you, but I <laughs> Nothing good's going to come of that. It's just not going to come of that. But people have done it time and time again. And so the extra measure of will is that, is that reconciliation, that God always was there to reconcile or justify himself to his people. He was always there to justify his people, always bring a righteous out of the, out of the sinful wickedness of, their, of his people. He always did that. He always justified them. He always got a, a little piece of, of, of peace, a little, a little piece of them to have peace among Israel, even though the masses may be off the rails. He always did that, time and time again. And so when he's bringing in the extra measure of oil, it speaks to people at the beginning of their understanding, of their minds opening up to the secrets of the mysteries of God's word. They took along with them the reconciliation to God specifically, not just to his word, to the written word. It's the extra measure of oil, not to the written word, but to the living word as well. So this is what I, (laughs) in other words, people, there's an old adage people say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. There's an old statement like that, and they say what you um, what you do speaks so loud that what you say I can't hear. People say that too. So there's a lot to be said about like your behavior, if you will. And so there's uh, a lot of folks that I know, and, and I think that I'm not going to name any names. I'm not doing that, but you all know who they are. Uh, for the most part, we've all been encountering similar, similar folks, and I I, I can tell you. I, I've been around a lot of people, and, and, and there's always some problems that we have in not reconciling this. So it's important to know, I can't hammer this home enough, that the scripture says clearly, they having taken, in verse 3, uh, the, the foolish virgins who have taken the lamps, and, and they took not, or out of taking, the ek laban, they did not take, you see that in verse 3, they did not take out of taking the lamp. So the lamps, the word is a lamp unto my feet. They took the word. And a light unto my path. What lights the lamp? The, you have to have a, a light. But what's going to keep the light lit? The oil. 
you can have the Word of God all you want. So people say, I know the Word of God. It doesn't matter if you know the letter of the law. You have to have the spirit of understanding. It does nothing to know information. So good luck with that. So people once have always said to me, well, I can know what you know. Anybody can do what you're doing. Uh, okay, first of all, stop. It's not about me. I could care less. But the more important thing is, forget me. Imagine me being, I'm just dead. Okay, forget about that. Any human who wants to approach reading the scripture can't just go, I'm just going to read it, and I'm going to just by, if, my, if I'm smart enough, I'm disciplined enough, and I'm consistent enough, I can learn everything I want to learn about the Bible. No. Sorry. It's not the way it works. God said, I didn't, I didn't write the book. God said, Hebrews 6, 3, these things you do if I permit. Sounds like he's in charge. Sounds like no matter what you think or what you want to do or what you think you want to do, so much for the old mom and dad lie and the, and the teacher's lie, you can, you can be anything you want to be. Well, apparently not. Apparently you're only what God wants you to be. So you can dream dreams, that's great, but just know God's in control. Don't try to tell God, well, I want to be this, so I have to be, you have to listen to me. Oh, yeah, that, that's not going to go well. I would not do that. So dream all you want, that's great. Dream, dream, dream. But you're going to come a point where you realize from a child to an adult that God's in charge. You know, and you're going to realize, oh, not a bad thing. It's a good thing. At first, it's going to frustrate you, but you're going to realize that it's actually a good thing. It brings you a lot of comfort knowing God's in control. So you start realizing what you're here for, what your purpose is, your value, your, your lane. So in this case, I don't remind you that they did not take the oil. So they, they took the Word of God as their premium and did not consider the one who wrote it as important enough or as valuable enough of who wrote it what he wrote and the information that was there to make them look more astute than other people, that was more important to them. That's pretty foolish, isn't it? That's, I didn't call them foolish. God did. Just pointing that out. So, wonder why God would say that. Yeah, that is foolish, isn't it? So when they do that, that's what the oil is talking about. So I want people to understand this. So there are so many things that, that we do. I, I, I can't even... I, there's so many things that we do that that are sabotaging our Christian walk, that are sabotaging our spiritual uh, benefits, and, and we think because we have a certain knowledge that, that somehow there's some ecclesiastical whiteout, God just goes, yeah, 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 yeah. well, yeah, he can forgive you, no doubt about it, but don't think that there's not a consequence for that. And he's right telling you what it is. He's gonna expose you for what you are. A person with knowledge, the lamp, and you did not take the oil, you did not out of taking the lamp go, you know, I want the information from God, but God himself and his requirements and, and indictments against me and accountability, you know, I'm going to take that and with tongue in cheek, with a grain of salt. I, I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take the information, though, I feel good about knowing that I'm better than everybody else and I'm smart and I know about God and what's going to go. So what? So what? If you don't understand that you're subjected to this accountability. And that's him saying, you can fool people all you want, but when you get to this place, it looks like you didn't fool anybody, did you? Doesn't look so good, does it? It's not funny. So he's trying to tell you, please don't do that. That's what he's telling the story for, to let you know. He's, the jig is up. He's on to you. You can't like go, he's gonna, uh, I'm, I'm having everybody is the same. No, no, yes. Yeah, okay. babe, sorry. First of all, uh, Vicki said, it seems so impossible to me that these five foolish virgins that had the oil and supposedly knew what it represented would not take that extra with them. Todd said, I think, Vicki, it takes work and time. Vicki said, it seems that their <coughs> understanding about the oil was not complete. Well, Pam said, right, Vicki, doesn't seem that the extra measure was very precious to them. Laney said they were comfortable with what they knew, but didn't realize this was not enough. Getting too comfortable. So let me, let me remind you what your points are all well taken and very well said. So let me remind you of our, our friend and often misunderstood, um, unfortunate friend in Judas. People say he's some evil doer. No, stop. He loved Jesus. So I don't want to hear any other garbage about, he hated him. No, he did not. He loved him, okay? So he loved him. He just wanted what he was saying, it went through his ear hole, and he's like, man, I know the scripture. I read Zechariah. This is throwdown time. And don't lie to me and sit there and go, I would have discerned it. No, you would not have. Stop lying. He was just telling the truth. He saw scripture said, 
on the white horse, on the donkey and the colt would come in and then the government would be subdued and he's like, this is the deal. We've talked about that, that the cows come home. So he just wanted to make it happen. So he took the word of God, but he did not take the accountability to that word, which is to embrace the person. We saw the same story take place with Mary and Martha, didn't we? When she was scurrying around the house, getting all things clean, and, and he says, Martha, just <laughs> be still, right? So there's the whole aspect of we all can say we love Christ, and that's why someone once said to me about you know, the obedience issue, and that's why the, one of the scriptures this week, I talked to you about, about Saul in the, one of the devotions. Uh, it, Saul tried that. But don't, don't go back to, even though he's Old Testament, uh, understand, he, he was a good guy. He had a humble heart, it says. He didn't want to be king. People chose him. He was a warrior that fought for God. And all of a sudden, it just got to him about people clamoring to, to constantly manipulate him and say, please do this, do this, do this. And But Samuel said, you can't do that. You, you can't sacrifice. And before that, just do this, what I tell you. Kill everything, every animal and the king. Well, I'm going to save some animals, and I'm going to save the king and bring him in and subdue the king and so people can see God's the man. And then they can also have sacrifice to God. He's like, I don't care what your intentions are. That, that's, you don't listen. Listen. And so he was thinking, you know, different things. He was justifying, right? So the point is people try to justify who God is in their minds. And that, that all comes from the lack of not understanding what oil represents, which is at its core, it's reconciliation. What was Jesus doing? By, by the way, let's remember. So if you go over to, in, in 1 Corinthians, to remind you, to go to 1 Corinthians, I'm going to remind you of this. Or second, excuse me, I said first, I think it's 2 Corinthians. I remind you what Christ was doing when it speaks to the, to the oil, right, on the cross. So he says that Christ, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, he says in verse 18, or verse 17, actually, for, all, for if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation, the old things have passed away, behold, all things become new, but all things are from that God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given to us the ministry of, the ministry of reconciliation. So it's, do you understand what's going on here? They want to have the benefit without the accountability of the ministry that's been imputed to you. So it's almost like saying, oh, I was a kleptomaniac and I went to jail. And I serve my time and I get to go free now. But the warden says, if you don't want to have any recourse of negative consequence, you have to teach other kids. Your ministry is to teach other kleptomaniac kids not to do this and why it's wrong. You understand? I want to teach them why you did it that was wrong. I want you to fall on the sword and tell them the despicable nature of why you did it because you were greedy, because you were selfish, because you were arrogant, because you thought you could get away with it. And I want you to tell all, I want you to do this day after day after day until all these kids are understand not to do what you did, right? So you can be, you can pay, you can, you can receive the word of freedom, I'm out of freedom, but do you take on the ministry of what comes with that? You see? You're freed when Christ saved you from your sin. You're freed when, when now all of a sudden you learned about the secret. You're freed from the old thinking and to now new, having new wineskins. But you, but you are disconnected from the sense of, wait a minute, the oil represents a ministry of reconciliation. I have an accountability to not just the Word of God, but to the actual living Word of God, not just the written Word, the living Word. That's a big... I, so what you're talking about, I want to make sure you saw, it talks about that in, all, in the rest of the verses about Him reconciling Himself to us. That's what our job is. And so when you go back to first, um, um, Matthew 25 and the verse, a couple of verses there, when it said they didn't take the oil, they didn't take the ministry. They didn't take on the obligation. I, I can't even say it enough. It's like a person who goes to college, pays a tuition payment, attends the class, knows the information, cold. But when the final exam comes or when the test comes along the way, they're so self-absorbed and arrogant, they don't feel the need to be subjected to take such tests and they fail miserably. Or they get drunk and plastered the night before and they end up failing. So what good was that tuition anyways? I'm just wondering, you effectively threw away money, right? And that's foolish, right? So you know the information, congratulations. Did you get a degree to go along with it? Did you get sanctioned to allow yourself to practice under said profession that you know the information of? Did you pass the, re the regulatory environment process from which to then operate in that field? That you knew the information? Did you actually just finish the, pro did you follow through? No, is that foolish? 
Yes, that's ignorant, as a matter of fact. Why would you do that? Why would you pay the price, which is hard, by the way, to learn the scriptures of secrets. It's not easy. It's, it's hard, right? You pay the price, and then you actually know the information, but you discount it or discard it, or both, the fact that you have a ministry and accountability to do something with that that requires you to change your life. Oh, I don't want to do that. I just want to learn. That's all I want to do. I'm going to learn, and I'm good. It's not, it's not like that. I mean, let me tell you something. You know what's hard? Is when you have uh, factions in your family. That's when it's hard, right? It's easy to see people say, oh, I got, I got godliness all around me, and God's like, I'm walking on sunshine when I wake up. Those people who act like that, they're liars. <laughs> There's something going on. You don't want their life. Just try, you don't want it. You may think you do. You don't. There's always something going on with everybody. And so you got to figure out, how do I deal with that, that son, that daughter, that grandson, that, that, that whatever, that husband, that wife, that mom, that dad, that brother, that sister? How do you deal with your family dynamics? And it's not just something God just happen chance just put in your life, and I'm not telling you what to do with it. I, that's not my thing. That's God's thing. But I can tell you this. Every relationship has a reason. Every single one has a reason and a purpose because God doesn't just go, yeah, could I put a brother in there oh, and a kid? It doesn't matter. Yeah, a boy, girl, doesn't matter. Yeah, right. No. Everything is specific. Every human, every personality trait, everything they did right and wrong to you, all that stuff, and you to them, it's all matters. And so you got to figure out, like, wait a minute, now that I have this higher level of knowledge, taking along this oil means I have to take along the ministry of reconciliation. I have to be at peace with not just the spiritual things in my life, everything in my life. Have I done an inventory of that? And it starts with, guess who? The man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, the human in the mirror. Have you done that to yourself? And these people that are foolish think that they're just, you know, hey, I'm walking on sunshine, baby. And don't tell me you don't know these people, because I know I know them. They walk around like, put a little Jesus on it. Well, that's, that's nice and all, but, and I, and I get you, thank you, I, I appreciate that. But there's also some things that are sobriety in life that are more that are serious. It's not not everything's not all fun and games all the time. And so you have to just you have to have a positive attitude. I get it. Supposed to be joyful. I get it. But there's a time and a place for everything. Solomon says, right? So these people. That's why it says in verse five, the bridegroom delayed. In their mind, he delayed. Now why why would he delay? In their minds. Now think about it. If they're in heaven for one day, I want to also remind you. Remember the midnight cry is what ends the Ariston. Which means, guess what? When did the Ariston start? At midnight. If it ends at midnight, which it does, then it begins at midnight. You go, I don't understand. Think about this. It begins when there's Armageddon. What's Armageddon? A time of judgment. You got Gog and Magog battle too. You have Jehoshaphat and you have the Bema Sea. Time of judgment. Right? You got also what's going on. You have at the end of the millennial reign, another time of judgment. You have the great white throne, you have the inspection going on in heaven, you have people in the sea and death and Hades are brought before and they're all thrown in the lake of fire, second death. I didn't write the book, right? The millennial reign begins and ends with a time of judgment. It begins and ends at midnight. Which is why, by the way, why do you think the virgins went out at, at, with torches? Because it was sunlight out? Yeah, that makes sense. Who does that? Who goes? Who, who, is, who in your life has ever used a flashlight in the middle of the bright sunny day? Who, who does that? No, nobody, because you don't need to. It makes no sense. But you do use a torch when it's night. <laughs> you sure enough do. That's right. Why do you think God said they went out with their lamps? Because it was night. It started at midnight, and it ends at midnight. And that's why they're thinking, that's why they're saying he waited, he waited there waiting to, like, what's taking him so long? We've been there, we've been there for a whole day. Let's go. Let's go on with the show. What's the next movement of this, you know? And so when they, when they have this aspect of these foolish people who nod and, and then who put their lamps in order, or, you know, trying to really they put that, that phrasing there, they put their best presentation forth. I think I put that on the board somewhere when I wrote it out for you. They, they put it in order. Um, they actually, I don't know if I have it on the board or not, but they actually put things in order to have the best presentation to, for, for God. And it's like, um, wait a second. So if you remember, when you remember the, the, the unjust steward from which the foolish go to market to, the question was asked to me, well, wait a second, President, why is it that they don't go to the, to the wise and ask him? Because the wise have everything to lose and there's nothing they could give. They're about 
retaining and obtaining. So in heaven, you have to retain and obtain. Just understand that. There's no, you can't disperse. You can't do, that's not what it's about. It's about retaining and obtaining more. You can't, di, you can't di, dilute, I mean, divest yourself in heaven. You, no, no. You in, invest people on the earth to help them, and you invest in each other, but you, you have to retain and obtain as you're investing in other people. You can't just, you can't go down. You, and that's why they're saying, I, 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 I can't. It's insufficient. There's not enough. So they have to go to the unjust steward. Why? Because he has nothing to lose. Because his stewardship was taken from him. And he was told, you're out. You're never coming back. Okay. So he has nothing to lose to give what he, all, he, all he can give. So the difference is, remember the unjust steward, when he says in Luke 16, he has no strength to dig and he's too ashamed to beg. This is back in Luke 16. But then when he goes to the one person with the, with the cores of wheat, and he says, you, you, how much do you owe? And they said, 100 cores of wheat. And he says, uh, write down 80. And finally, it dawns on me in relationship to this story. You know what that's talking about? What it's really saying is, is this is what the foolish virgin didn't know, remember? They came with no extra measure of oil. So in their mind, they know that they owed 100 fruit. They know this, the kingdom teaching of Mark 4 and Matthew 13. But they thought that they had a hundred fruit. And that's why when he asked the question, how much do you owe? And they go, a hundred. But now they realize they ain't got it. Uh -huh. And he says, and so he's assessing what they have and says, you better write down 80 because that's all you got. You better confess where you are, who you are, and stop posturing with narratives. Not a time to play games. It, that, <laughs> God gave you your entire lifetime, and you, and you muck that up. you just all mucked and mired with all that sin and, 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 and posturing. Now you're in heaven, did the same thing. Now you're at the very last hours here. It's not funny. Do you understand? Now, I had you say to me, what is the number? He, 100. So you knew it's 100 fruit. You, just did, you thought you had that? Obviously, you wouldn't be talking to me if you had that. You have 80. Are we clear? And they went, oh my, yes. I get it, yes. How do I get the other 20? So he helps them, and that's why he's applauded, because he got them to acknowledge their shortfall, because they were in denial about it. And so here you have this aspect of what's happening when they arose and, and, and the other, they all rose up. Remember the arose in verse 7 speaks to this egero. E Some rose up to a, a different body, the, 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 the wise, and the foolish, not so much. They rose up from their... They're, they're nodding, and so it's not sleeping physically, it's more of a metaphor to show that they were sleeping, and it's a spiritual sense, getting in their stupor, as scripture talks about, arise, O sleeper, and, and be of, of diligence in your spirit. So then in verse 10, when he says, and while they were going away to buy, meaning the foolish are going down, remember, when you're in the heavens and you're going to earth transversing, there's a time period of distinctive difference so like a minute in heaven is like a year on earth, you know? There's a big distinction, difference there, you know? And like it's commensurate of the same time frame. There's different time frames there. So when you say midnight hour, it still gives you plenty of time here on earth, if you're down here, to get time to go back up and it's not the same uh, commensurate time frame. So it says, when they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and they who were the prepared ones, and that's the he told moi, and that's the readied ones, those that were ready. Now, notice how he doesn't say, and the wise ones. People always ask me, well, why do you think that some of the foolish came to the place where they got some extra measure? Because of two reasons. One, the fact that he didn't say wise ones. If he was going to demarcate and say, the wise are the ones that came in, and the foolish are the ones that did not, why don't you just say that? I mean, I'm just pointing out the obvious question, right? It's not that hard to do. You just started off with a, a story with five foolish and five wise. You have very capable speech, Lord God. You made the language. You can easily, ten verses later, say, and the wise came in. But you didn't say that. You said, you, now, you, now you change not who they are, but you change the description of who they are. You said they're hematomoi. Okay, first you tell me they're wise and, they're, and their stature, but now you're telling me their description is that they're prepared. As if to say that you can be others that were included in this prepared one status, which would it's coincidentally come right after those who were going out to buy and sell, which makes me think that some of these remnant people were brought in. 
And then he says, and they were brought with him into the nuptial feast. And that's going back to, remember the verse uh, 6, that there was that second meeting. If you remember in verse 1, the word for went out into a meeting is excelthon, which means to leave out from, from earth to heaven, and the ariston, the second and third wave. And then, it, then it's ek, es, ekerseth, I can't say the word, ekerceste, which means to go to out of. So out of the ariston, they go to the dipnon, and that's the second meeting in verse 6. So there's two meetings, right? But now in verse 10, that's why he says that these prepared ones entered, into, entered, entered with him into the nuptial feast, plural, because they were in two meetings. They were already in one meeting, and now they're going into the other meeting, verse 1, verse 6. And then he says, and closed, which means, again, this is <laughs> out, of, out of taking those people in, it's, it's the, it's, it's, it says was closed, which is ek kleste, which means it was closed out of. In other words, it wasn't just closed. It was closed. The word ek klethte means it was closed out of the requirement being met that all those who were prepared had now been gathered in. It's time to close the door. There's nothing else to keep it open for. There's, there's no other reason. That's what it means. When he could have just said klethte, which means closed. He said ek klethte, which brings out the fact that it's closed out of having satisfied the need or the requirement or the desire to have gathered all the prepared ones he wanted or that were ready, he gathered them all in. And that there are everybody that was needed to roll calls all done. It was filled. We're good. Close. Then he says it was the door that was closed. Why the door? Because he's talking about the dipnon. That's why. Because why is the Mary's speech plural and the door is singular? Because there was two meetings, verse one, verse six. Singular door because now they're going into the dipnon. And afterwards came those remaining ones, and that's the lapai. La Leloipai, and that's the remaining three of the five. Why do I say three? Because I don't think the majority uh, got their act together. God always shows a clemency toward a remnant. So since there was five foolish, I think two were part of the prepared ones, which leaves three. So the lapoi, lapai, would mean those, again, another key phrase as to why I think uh, prepared ones included the wise and some of the foolish, because he didn't just say, and the foolish virgins, he said the remaining virgins. Another, another clue. So why are you now changing the adjectives? You could have just said, the wise were taken in and the foolish were left out. That's not what you said, Lord. He, he, I didn't write the book. He said the prepared ones were taken in and then the remaining ones were outside. Then they came. And they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, but the one answering said, indeed I say to you uh, that I know you not. I know you not meaning Aido, meaning the experiential uh, knowledge of. And I've always made that reference to, uh, since we're in the 21st century, they didn't see it this way, but we, we do. So if you could see something on your phone, for example, or on TV, you say, I saw the event, uh, I saw it live on my phone. Okay. But if you were actually at the event, it's a whole different thing. So that's the difference between knowing about something and Aido about is when you're actually there. So when he says, I don't know you. He's talking about the intimacy, the, the, <laughs> the close proximity of which they were posturing to act like, we got that, and they knew doggone well they didn't have that. Because you said, how would they know? Because they didn't take the oil when they took the lamb. They know. Don't lie to me. <laughs> Jesus is saying to them, yes, she was saying, come on. You can lie to everybody else all you want, but God, really? You kind of pull a fast one on him. It's not going to happen. So that's why he says in verse 13, he says, watch. And I, he talked about the gorgete again. Do I have it on the board? Did I erase it? Yeah, right here. Stay alert and stay awake. He's talking about, I reckon, he, he says, stay awake, stay awake. Therefore, because you know neither the day nor the hour. So, in other words, he's talking about the day or the hour. Now, why, remember, when he says the day or the hour, he's talking about a time of the tribulation period at the end from which how it would end. So, when he brings that up, he's talking about the ending of the tribulation period going into Armageddon. But at the same time, he's telling this to people that are the, the, the foolish that weren't prepared because they actually think, remember, they actually think that before everything happens bad, they're just, they're gone. 
How are they going to feel when they're still here? How are they going to feel even more so when they're the last ones that are still here when the first two waves already take place? They definitively don't know the day or the hour of when tribulation is going to end. And they might not know. Remember, that's why, remember, remember I told you about 1 Thessalonians. This all comes to bear when he says, watch you therefore, you know, the day or the hour. Because what he's trying to say is, um, you don't know if you're wise or foolish or just as soon medical. You go, what? I, remember, that's why he said, that's why he said those who are alive and remain. That's why in First Thessalonians study, we talked about that. God had Paul write to them and say, oh, there are living ones that aren't mature. There's living ones that are immature and living ones that are mature, right? You're about to find out who you are. What do you mean? Would you get caught up in a wave or not? That's how you find out. What? That's why he said the alive and remaining ones, you're alive, you just weren't mature enough to make it out. What? And that's why he says, watch, stay alert. You don't know who you are. Don't sell yourself short, or I should say, think of yourself more highly than you ought to act like, you know, you're precluded from anything that's going to happen, and so you let your guard down and you, you know, take for granted things. I mean, come on. I, I know I've been there. I know that when I was in school, I, I have a brother. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but he knows who he is. He's one of the. It made me sick. He would not hardly study at all, and he would get like good grades on his tests. And they call that what a photogra photographic memory or in, in, in didactic memory, something like that. He, he had that because he would just like he would look at something and he would know. And I had to like study, man. I hate tests. Hate them because I always thought of them as, as labeling me as stereotyping me, and I just hate that. I hate being labeled, I hate being stereotyped, I hate it when anyone does that to anybody, I just abhor it to the core. It's a big thing with me, so I hate tests. I just don't, I never, I, I, maybe because that's what I always felt like my parents did to me. I don't know. I just know my one brother, he just would like read it once, like he, he, he'd he glance at this board and know everything on there and then walk away. I'm like, not even fair! I have to memorize it. He, he just, and he wouldn't even know what it means sometimes he would just know the information and be able to do the test and answer and ace it and i'm like not even close to fair right but that's kind of what some people are they think they can just like put it on autopilot because they think that they're you know qualified in their knowledge and therefore they don't put forth the effort they have things memorized about god's secrets and mysteries and they got it in going for them so hey i'm good not so fast that's what a foolish person does just make sure you take the oil with you so the question I'm going to I'm going to get to in just for in a minute, but back here first, yeah. Okay, Pam said, if they are entering into the nuptial feast, plus meaning Ariston and Dipnon, then how is the day and hour referring to the end of the trip? If they're already entering the Dipnon, I'm confused. Yeah, that's a good point. So, because <laughs> good point. Thank you. No, great point. Thank you. I mean, thank you for saying that. That's a great question. I want to make sure I'm, I'm, okay. So what I'm saying is because the the time frame of the story of the kingdom of the heavens compared to 10 virgins from verses 1 to 12 is a rapture time that includes what's going on in the millennium, millennial reign and the heavenly and the kingdom of the heavens, right? But because he's focused on the, the, the result of the just desserts of the foolish ones who got where they were because they didn't, they didn't take along with the lamp the measure of oil, which happened while they were on the earth, right? They went out to meet him. They didn't take their lamps along with the oil. So that happened prior to the meeting, prior to the rapture. So the reality is that he's, he, he's, he's ending up the statement of fact retroactively saying, this is the story of impact. So let's go back. He's got kind of like mapping out their future and saying, let's go back to what's causing all of this because you didn't watch, because you weren't alert and awake, because you got complacent, arrogant, you got presumptuous, you got lazy. Put all the adjectives you want in there. I, don't, I can't speak between how, you, how God sees you, but we all know we've been in different places where we shouldn't be when it comes to taking God for granted, right? I'm just telling you, I, I can admit it. I'm not happy about it, but it's the truth. And that's just something that we don't want to be at that place as, as our core of how we see God and His Word. I've had moments like that in my life, but, and they've, some have lasted longer than I'd like to admit. A lot of kids are yelling out there, aren't they? The door's locked, by the way. 
So, so does that help to answer your question? Does that help answer your question, babe? I mean, back there, Pam? Oh, um, there was another question. Uh, Vicki said, can you explain again why you think that seven virgins enter and three remaining? And then Pam said, kind of. Okay, I'm going to go back over Pam's question again. Let me answer um, Vicki. I appreciate the honesty. So Vicki's question was about why do I think there's seven? Okay, so the thought, because here's why. Because when he says... Um, the prepared ones entered in. He didn't say the wise ones. He didn't say the prudent ones, right? So because he didn't say the wise and the prudent ones, it makes one believe and, and understand there's a reason why he would do that. Yes? Yeah, babe? And then Vicki said, does it also mean that if you enter through the door, there is a good chance you could enter into Dipnot? Not a good chance. You will. If you enter through the door, then that means that you've had the requisite fruit of 100 plus the other 100, which now means that you actually are qualified to be the bride. You don't enter into that door in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 10. That door that's being opened up to you, and you're the prepared ones. The prepared ones have 100 fruit that they retained and 100 fruit that they obtained. It's two different things. Remember Matthew 13's difference? Remember, this is, goes back to some old teaching that we haven't done in a long time. But remember, I didn't write the book, remember, in Matthew, remember the distinctive difference in Matthew? The sower and the seed, they bear and yield. Luke 8 and Mark 4 do not say that. No, they do not. No, they do not. No, they do not. Matthew 13 says bears and yields because they retained the hundred and they obtained another. And that's why they put into the Matthew 10 Dipnon, that's why the door was shut. Those are the prepared ones. Yes? And Vicki said, I thought the second 100 fruits were to be earned in a day seven, and you present them at the great white throne. So, okay, three things. Number one, we are in day seven in this parable of Matthew 25 and the kingdom of the heavens. This is all going on in day seven. So they are earning it, right? by the Jacob side of the ministry going to and from heaven and earth. Number two, you do present uh, your other, but number three, not at the great white throne. It's at the inspection and that takes Nikki place. And then said, oh, right. Yeah, it takes place in the heavens. So the inspection period is at, at the place in the heavens where, or Christ calls it going from wheat to fine wheat, uh, sifting that wheat, going from a fork to a shoveling process, uh, as they call it over in the Old Testament. So there's a reference to uh, the end of the Ariston is a father, God the Father, uh, seeing who's qualified and dignified to be presented to his son, which is interesting because that's the same phraseology in the metaphor that when they say they put their lamps in order, they're trying to present themselves in the best possible way for the father to say, come on in to be qualified as my bride for my son. And he's like, but they don't see, remember, remember we, we're too ignorant. We, we, God makes it clear in Isaiah. We, we look pretty good in our own eyes. We're like, yep, look good. And God goes, you do realize you look like menstrual rags, not my words, menstrual rags, leprosy rags that are clothed all over you. I, I find that quite disgusting. You go, no, I look awesome to the nines. Yeah, baby. You know, he's like, no, no, you look pretty gross. Matter of fact, he says filthy rags. It's the words used for menstrual rags and leprosy rags. And we think that's awesome because we don't know. We don't mean to do that. I'm um, going to take the high road. And we're just ignorant. We don't understand God's level of right. So they're trying to present themselves, and God's going, you think you qualify? No. And that's why the unjust do it. They go, how much do you owe? And they go, 100. And he goes, exactly. Uh, and that's why you're here because you don't have it. Right 80, because that's what you got. Because he can know how to discern it. Because he had it, and he lost it. He knows exactly what it looks like. He goes, yeah, this is not, this is not what 100 looks like. I can tell you right now, you wouldn't even be here if you had 100. So <laughs> you better just write down 80 and get the other 20 that you need, because that's, what you, that's what's going on right now. You fell way short. And so that's a problem. So yes? 
And Vicki said, wait, uh, verse 10 says, enter to the nuptials, which would seem like they are entering the Ariston, which is at the beginning okay. of day seven. Okay, so again, what's happening here in verse 10, to remind you, there is two meetings. You must have like missed some of this that we said. So I know it's always hard to, it's easy, sometimes it's, we all don't understand each other sometimes. You guys have your own distractions to deal with at your own homes. And Vicki said, I heard that. And I have my distractions here sometimes as well. That's why there's some noises outside, for example. But we all have a different thing. But I can tell you this, that just to help you out, to remind you, so in verse 1, there's a meeting. In verse 6, there's a meeting. Ariston, verse 1. Okay? They go out to the Ariston. Then they got delayed and they, oh, when's he taking so long? And they nodded off. And there's another meeting, Dipnon, they're being called into. I didn't write the book. There's two meetings. Verse 1, verse 6. Ver 1 and 6. 1 and then verse 6. Right? So verse 10 is saying nuptial feast plural because he's saying you've entered into both because you've already been in the one and now you're going into the other one because you now are prepared to do so and now the door singular is shut of the dipnon. Does that help make some sense? I know that you probably heard me say it, but maybe you just kind of weren't catching on what I was saying. So there's a meeting in verse 1. I, that's what the word uh, says. Vicki said, why then is verse 10, in verse 10, does it refer to both? What is the reason to say that again? Because he's, <laughs> okay, so great point. Because he's bringing up the fact that they entered in with the lamp, because the emphasis, remember the emphasis here. The emphasis, okay, the reason why, great question. Why is it plural in verse 10? If, oh, if they're entering into one of the second movement of the nuptial fleece, plural, right? Because yes. the reason why you're going to the second nuptial feast is because, here's why, because you entered the first one the right way. Do you understand? So, if you don't come to the first one with the right oil, you don't have an assurance or a good opportunity to enter in the second one. You're not prepared to even be able to enter in the second one. So the reality is that they entered the first one, the foolish, and I didn't write the book, right? In verse 3, they ek lumba, they out of taking the lamp, did not take the oil. So he's referencing the first feast as if to say, you brought this on yourself, those who aren't coming into this feast. And in like reverse order, those who are going into the Dipnon feast, you helped yourself and you put yourself in a good position by taking the lamp along with that. You took the oil. You put, I, you put yourself in a great position to be able to enter into this feast. So the reason he's mentioning both feasts is because he's putting a high, high import on how you entered the Ariston. That's what he's saying. How you came to class. Uh, whatever, dude. Go ahead and teach, bro. That's not a bad... What? If you come with the ready to learn, you're, you're, you had a good night's sleep, you're paying attention to the professor, how you entered into the class determines how you learn, right? How you entered into the Ariston determines your predisposition which is why I keep saying that term people don't like sometimes. Hey, that's, I'm just, that, <laughs> he told you that they didn't have the extra measure of oil. That's their predisposition. That's why he's mentioning the feast plural. He's putting a high import on the predisposition they started off with when they entered, which is what allows them or does not allow them to inherit. That's what's costing them. That's why he's referencing both feasts. Does that make sense, what I'm saying to you? Is that, do you follow that? Okay. Do you follow that, Vicki? Does that make sense? I'm going to get to Pam's question in a minute. Um, if it doesn't make sense, it's okay. Let me know, and I'll try to help. She said yes. Okay, cool. So to, to Pam's question. Then, about, Vicky said, I guess it's uh, redundant. Well, it's not so much redundant as it is. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, remember, it's, uh, it, it's Christ's way. Okay, th think about this. 
when he had his last supper and he came in to the last supper I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be facetious or sarcastic or a smart aleck by any means by me telling you this I'm trying to helpfully I'm trying to truly sincerely help to explain what you just said about it seems redundant but that's how God does things a lot of times. It seems done it to us, but it's really not. He's trying to make it, let it soak in what he said and what he did. So when he came into the Last Supper, he takes the basin with the cloth, right? And Judas is there, and he washes all their feet, including him. Like, right? Knowing what you know in retrospect as an apostle, how do you not look back at that moment and go, holy smackerels. He, so he knew that he was going to, and he, why do, why even do that? Why not do that when he's gone? Why, what's that about? That was crazy time. Why even do it before, but then, okay, why include that joker? What's that about? And then when, Jesus, when Judas does his, you know, deal, and don't believe me, in John 13, read this story. Jesus says, as soon as he did that, in this moment, God was glorified. Glorified? He just betrayed you. But what? So then you... You put things together and you say, well, well, why did Philippians say that it, it and, you know, that he was humbled and to death, obedient and to a cross? And in Isaiah 53, it pleased God to bruise him. And then you go back to the redundancy issue of Christ doing what he did to the 12 apostles at the Last Supper. He gets crucified, comes back to, comes back to life, raises up from the dead, and he tells him in the room that night, not Resurrection Sunday, but that evening, which would be Monday, he appears to them and says, oh, um, the sins you loose on, on earth are loose in heaven, you retain or pertain in heaven. Okay, why are you, okay, wait, 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 wait. You're talking, in essence, about similar things that you've already basically talked about when you said we are all wholly clean, but not all, not all in the, our walk, not all the, the partial clean. He said kind of the same thing, didn't he? About you're all wholly clean, but you need, but you need to have your feet washed. If Peter said, wash me all over, he said, no, 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 you're all holy clean, but, but one, you need to have your feet washed. He was talking about the sins that need to be forgiven of ourselves and for each other. That's what he's talking about, our walk. He just phrased it differently when he came back from the dead three days later and said, oh, by the way, the sins you retain, you retain, and what you lose, you lose. In other words, why are you harboring your sin? Why, why are you doing that? How many axes and, 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 and little, uh, you know, Axes do you have, I mean, hidden in your backyard, by the way? Why are you grinding those bad boys? Isn't it time to do away with them? I don't understand. What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of that? But would you put away the, the, the axes, you know? And all these other hatchets you want to, like, just stop. Whatever you retain here, guess what? That disposition? You take it with you, my friend. Hello? What'd you, how'd you not think that was going to happen? Well, I'm a sinless person, and then you forget all my sin. Well, he, he does. Forgive all your sin. But that, that, that little taking of the lamp and then not taking it all with you, harboring this stuff, got to come back to haunt you. That's what he's trying to tell you. He, he think, it's just not funny. I love you. Absolutely I love you. It's going to come back to haunt you. You know, like, see Judas. He would talk all, he, if he could talk now from the grave and from the heavenlies, he would say, oh my gosh, heavy price to pay. Heavy price to pay for loving Christ, but yet trying to get things done your own way. Heavy price to pay. Heavy price to pay for taking the lamp of the word unto my feet, but not taking the light unto my path, having the oil be his presence in my life, being what was enough for me. I wanted what he could do for me, and what I wanted his word to be for me, instead of just being content with him. Boy, did that go south quickly for him. And he could, I mean, I, I I'm, I'm probably never going to see him, but it's one of my things. If God were to ask me one thing on, on and when it comes to human beings, who could I have an interaction with to, to show love and compassion with? It, it'd be him. I want to just give him a hug and say, you know what? I get it, man. It, it would have, could have, should have been me. And um, I feel so sorry for you, you know? And just to kind of just let him know. It's, I mean, I love you, man. It's okay. I know that you, I know people say it wasn't for you. You wouldn't. Have, yeah, but he had to die. So you were just the one that was used. And don't let that, I know it's hard to get over that. But I would just try to encourage him the best I could and let him know, you know, I love you, man. It's okay, you know? It's, it's okay. We've all done some horrible things. It just so happens that you have a pretty serious one on the ledger. I, I get it, and I can't understand it, but I get how that could probably be just destroying to you. It just, if it counts for anything, I love you, man. Love you, Judas, brother. You must be a brother, you know? And I would just say we're both sinners. Yours is just a bigger gravity than mine, granted, and you're a lot more notoriety than mine, that's for sure. But we're still both at the core of sinners. So 
who am I to say I'm better than you because I know I'm not. So that's just kind of how I, I think I try, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help you see that God would say the same thing differently as you said is saying it differently again when he says um, the nuptial feast. And you're kind of going back and highlighting the, how you came into the Ariston. I hope that makes some sense what I'm saying. Jesus is known for doing this kind of thing. He would say something and then re-say it differently, different ways. He does that a lot, right? That's not, I mean, God does that a lot. So yeah, sorry, yes. Um, Lainey said, Judas let him do that without any reservation. Can I imagine how Judas must have truly felt when Jesus did wash his feet, calloused? Yeah, and, there, and there's people that, um, that I know now, I, I can't speak in specific nature of this, but people that I know now um, that have dealt with issues that um, their sins are, are, are very grievous. Um, I can't even mention what they are, but they're extremely grievous. And it's, I can tell you this, they're sins that not every human factually takes part in. And so because of that, they have a very um, hard time um, ever seeing the world through a lens of um, hope or forgiveness in a, in a heavenly uh, blessing. It, it, it's hard. It's difficult. And so, but, it, it, you know, James Dobson, he, he said that Ted Bundy, on the night before he was killed, uh, electric chair, is he, he, for the first time, he confessed to his sins of what he did. Before that, he didn't confess to anything. He denied, 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 denied. Then the day before he was put to death, he confessed his sins. And according to James Dobson, he, was, he did it in such a way where he was remorseful, tearful, and very uh, penitent and crying out for mercy to God. The God that James Dobson told him about, which is the true God of the Scripture, God the Son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Some would say, oh, Dobson's just being religious and he's trying to be nice and he's giving the nicest view of a human possible because that's his job as a ministry guy to give the nicety of the best possible positive view of any, any despicable human. Okay, well, how about this? How about did you know that before Dobson saw him, there was also an FBI agent that saw him, and as they were talking, he took the pen from the FBI agent, and he said, there's no way they're going to kill me. I'm gonna kill myself. So he had the pen, and he was gonna stab his artery and have his, he said, his blood just gush out, and by the time they got there, it'd be too late, he'd die. And then the FBI agent, who has no reason to lie, right? He's not a religious guy, if you will, in ministry. Believed in Christ, but not a religious guy in that sense of positional-wise. He just said, but if you, you said that you had so many people on your ledger and you wanted to have forgiveness, how is one more going to help your cause if you do believe in a supreme being after this life that you have to be accountable to and you want clemency? And he said to Ted Bundy, he goes, you got me there. You're right. And he put the, not, they put the pen down. So why would he do that? You know? And so it just kind of, my point is, people don't have to do with a guy like that because being and knowing what he has done and knowing he's now dead, it's easy to say, oh, thief on the cross, oh, he, you know, I read the story in the Bible and Jesus said to be with me in paradise. That's cool, man, that's awesome. He got to be in paradise. But technically, that means Ted Bundy was forgiven also. How do you feel about that? Right? So people sometimes go, how can a foolish virgin even be there? Um, how could Ted Bundy even be forgiven? It's crazy, but God forgives. Everyone. What's that? The same way that Paul was. That's right. Exactly. It's exactly right. Same way that Paul was. That's why I told this other person, persons. I said, you know, this is why people gloss over the Apostle Paul and his heinous acts. They don't want to talk about the fact that who knows how many humans are on his ledger of life that was taken. There's no count given in the Bible. But if I was to venture, venture to say, if he went on rampages on, say, just once a week, once a week, traveled for three days there, three days back, did one day of rampaging, let's just say on one day of rampaging a week, he killed three people. He did that for two years. You, you, you do the math. That's a lot of humans, especially when they're women and children and men. But Paul doesn't talk about it, nor does God put a number to his ledger of human lives that he took. But no one wants to talk about that. Well, why am I bringing it up now? Why am I getting off, off base? I'm not off base. 
I'm getting back to the point, I'm going to get the pants question too still, which is the disposition in Paul was not dictated by what he was or what he did. It was dictated by remembering what he did, living in the consequence of what he did, and realizing that the thorn in his side was that he has to live with that anguish as just as well as those people do as well. And as God gives them strength, God's giving him strength, and it can't be any different. That would be unfair. How is that just? to give the murderer a release from his consequence of his torment, but not the ones who are the victims. And so Paul always realized the disposition in him was to recognize his past in a, in a healthy way, but he, embra- he reconciled to that. He took the lamp of God's word with the oil. Remember, the year before he died, he wrote to Timothy, for God saves sinners of whom I am chief. He always never lost sight of the depravity of the disgusting nature of what he had done. I would argue that the cows come home. The guy did not walk like, I'm walking on sunshine. He always had a sense of sobriety to him of, oh, no, you know, what? how can I ever give back what I've taken? And that's why he dedicated so much of his spirit, soul, life, body, mind to, to what he was called to do and be. And that's the thing between a wise and a foolish person. Paul was from such a disparity he was easy easier people would say for him to do that because he has such a dichotomy but the point is that's the message that we're supposed to have is that that disposition we should have is such a fervor and zealousness to want to give back with such gratitude like paul had you just get transformed by christ on the inside out that's the bottom line you should just be aware and acknowledging and reconciling to your past but embrace it for what it is and move forward with the hope and joy and peace of taking on a ministry because of that what you owe what you owe God and what you owe other people back is like a hundred times more, right? But how could you ever act arrogant? How could you ever act self-absorbed or presumptuous if that be in his past? But, but he did do that at the beginning because that's just called being human. It takes a while to, to get transformed and adjust. It took him a couple years, but he didn't stay that way forever. <laughs> no, 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 no. It took him just a few years and he tweaked quickly. Boy, he grew up fast in front of us spiritually. He went from being a little ignoramus, a little arrogant, brash, rough on the edges. Took him just a few years, and then he went from three years with Christ, then a couple of years he was off the reservation a little bit, not realizing Barnabas was putting his life to help him, and boy, did he change. Boy, did he change for the better. What a, what a wonderful story about the Apostle Paul. Yes? Yeah, baby. Um, first of all, Lainey said, thief on the cross. Vicki said, can you say that the extra oil is the second 100 fruit? You need to enter the diaconob. The foolish virgins had earned it, but didn't use that ministry and left that behind, and thus they didn't have enough to inherit day eight. So, yes, kind of, yes that's kind of basically true. So the extra measure of oil having taken with them the spirit of serving and, 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 and taking the accountability of the ministry to serve the living word of God is part of how you're able to produce the extra hundred fruit. So it's kind of same, you're saying the same thing from a different angle. So the hundred fruit uh, out of the oil is what's obtained because of the premise of the, what the oil represents, which is the uh, abiding life of Christ in your life that you've taken on as a ministry of accountability to him on a personal level not an academic level, not a theological level, on a personal level. Like you actually have him in your life as if he's um, auditing you. <laughs> That's, yeah, imagine that. Like you're taking on the extra measure of oil, it's like you're having Christ come in your life as your personal auditor of your spirit, soul, mind, and body. Who's up for that? Who's up for, everybody goes, I'm a, who's, up, who's up for being audited by the IRS? By a show of hands, not me. Who wants to be audited by Christ? Not you, not me. But that's kind of what you're doing. When you take on the extra measure of oil, you're saying, I want Christ to audit my life in every way so that the lamp can be all the more the light lamp unto my feet so the light unto my path can shine so bright because I can shine brighter when I have the auditor, if you will, the author and finisher of our faith constantly calling me out for what I need to change and be different and be bettered on. Right? So that's kind of, And because of that oil being the personal reconciliation ministry to him to who you are and what your job is to 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 serve him 
because of that, in the heavenlies, in day seven, you can produce an extra hundred fruit. So it represents, to your point, but it's an outflow. It's not like it's start that way. It starts with that relationship with Christ founded that out of it flows that extra hundred. Yes, sorry, babe. Okay, uh, first of all, Vicky said, so I'm good. Laney so, said, a better now. So then, so then Sister Pam's point again goes back to, so why would he say watch therefore the day or the hour? This goes back to Sister Vicky's question, similar but different, because he's bringing up the import again of the fact that he's basically warning them to know that people don't realize that he wrote that statement to both foolish and wise because they both go into tribulation, right? He didn't, watch, for example, when he ends, when he ends that statement in verse 12, I recognize you not, then he said, watch therefore, watch you, watch you therefore, and you know not the day or the hour. So, but what he's talking about is, again, he's talking about watching as he did back in Matthew 24 in reference to the whole gamut of it. Like, in other words, whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, you, you do understand that you don't know the day or the hour of when I'm gonna be in my first Perugia. You, you do know that, right? Because remember, the day and hour combination, that, that context, when he says hour, he means the end of his first Perugia into his second, you know, his Perugia in the heavenly is revealed as, as, as that bridegroom. But his first Perugia, is that on the earth as the millennial reign of Christ. So that leading up to that is the day or hour we don't know, the days or hours, right? So when he's talking about that, he's talking about how these people don't understand that you should be alert and awake. Where's on the board here? You should be alert and awake in your spiritual behavior, right? Because you don't, you don't realize, just like what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, you may be alive but you don't know what God constitute as mature or immature. You ever caught yourself in that situation? For example, I mean, I mean, not to get rude, I don't mean to be rude when I say this, but there's been people that I've known in my life who are immature and are adults. And they'll say things, and I've acted myself immature as an adult. I mean, let's get real. I know I have. If you don't want to confess it, that's fine. I'll, lead. I'll start with the class. I'm an adult and I've acted immature. Okay, so if you don't want to say that, that's fine. But I'm telling you that I have. But I know people that actually don't just act immature, but they live in a state of how they think is immature. But what's scary is they will constantly compare themselves to other people that are clearly just not just immature, but just not really with it at all. And they'll say, gosh, I'm so, I'm so mature. Or compared to someone who's less mature than you, I, I guess so. But compared to what maturity looks like, especially given your age, no. And don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about, because I'm sure everybody has seen people like this, right? So we all do that whole comparison thing. And that's why Paul, First Thessalonians, is going, look, man, I don't think you get it. We, none of us really know. That's why we always ask each other the question, hey, man, who do you think is, what do you think is 30? I know what 30 might look like, and 60 might look like, and 100 might look like. But who that person is, specifically, what that person in general looks like, yeah, sure, I can give you a, a, a good idea of what I think, but who that person is exactly, like who am I, who are you? I don't know that for sure, man. That's why Paul was talking about how he never once came out with saying, I'm the bride, or the apostles came out going, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm a judge of the 12 tribes of Israel, even though they were told that. I mean, straight up, they were told that, straight up, you know? I mean, you imagine if, by the way, does it ever dawn on you that's probably why God didn't tell John until John was the last one alive? that their names are written on the New Jerusalem. I wonder why he waited till they were all dead to tell John that he's the last one alive. And he's on an island by himself. Just so you all, just so you know, John, guess what? Y'all's name's gonna be in the holy city. <laughs> he has no one to tell. <laughs> he can't go, woohoo! To himself, but he can't go, Peter, you believe, Peter, you believe, you believe it? He's not here. There's no, they're all dead. They're gone. He's all by himself when he finds the information out. How much does that suck? He finds out this awesome information he can want to share with his brothers, and he's like, ah. But in heaven, he can share with them there, but he's like, we all know here. <laughs> but on the earth, he was given the information toward the end of his life that no one else knew but him. Think about that. You ever think about that? So Paul's saying, look, you know, alive and remain means that you're alive in the secrets and mysteries, and you're alive walking and abiding in faith, hope and love, and that's great, that's awesome, that's wonderful, you're obedient. But what's your requisite fruit? <laughs> 
Are you mature enough or are you immature? I tell you who the decider is, it's God. It's certainly not me. <laughs> no, no. It's no man, no man, no human decides that. No human's like, oh, sit down, let me tell you, uh, you're 30. No, 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 no. We can guess, but I don't know for sure. And when I guess, I better do that with liberalness, not with definitive nature of judgment. I, it's in a, in, a, in a general sense of like, I, I guess that would be this, I guess that would be that. But the whole thing is, Paul's making it clear to us that God's the one who makes that assessment if you're immature or mature. So when he says in Matthew 25, 25, 13, watch you therefore, he's saying your behavior to be alive and awake is behooving upon you because you are alive. What you don't know is what your fruit yield is. So it'd be behooving upon you <laughs> to be consistently watchful and alert. Would you agree? Well, yeah. It's almost like, imagine if I was a teacher in class and I said, the top five students will get a scholarship to go to advanced schooling because you're in say a class that gets advanced schooling. Uh, they get a free ride and, and da 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 and the top five of the class and there's 30. You don't know who the top, you, you don't know what the grade, how do you know? There's nothing to grade it against. You're grading against each other. So how do you know when you hand in your exam, based on your exam, the top five exams, the top five essays, I, I don't know, how do you know that? You wouldn't know. You have a, you have a good guess. Well, this guy never, he never studies, and that gal, boy, she's really good. This guy always gets plastered on that, so he's not going to. But maybe maybe he had an off night. Maybe he woke up and just was sober. He, I don't know. So how do I know that there's not just some savant? You know, he likes to be a wild, crazy nutcase, but then he gets all serious on study time, and he gets this awesome essay. And we're like, oh, man. So how do I know? If they, the teacher says the top five. I don't know what that looks like. Top five? Um, I, don't, I don't know who, who that's going to be. I have an idea of who it's not going to be. Right? And I have an idea who it might be, but do I know who it's going to be? No. There's no way I would know that. If they're all in a class of higher learning, if you're all in a Harvard class, right? Not in some special needs class, right? I mean, a Harvard class, an Oxford class, a Princeton class, which is what he's talking to. He's talking to his apostles. They're, they're the higher level people. They're in a higher university. They're <laughs> He's telling them to watch and stay alert and awake because no one, he's giving a message to us who are given secrets and mysteries. Just don't get complacent, please. Just stay alert, stay, stay alive, stay vigilant because you just don't know who you are in the maturity scale. You know you're alive, that's great. I know that you're aware of the secrets, that's great. But where your fruit yield is, specifically, I don't know. I know it has to do with what you know and, how you, and what, you, what you do in your acts of love and kindness and obedience to Christ, yeah, sure. But I don't, I don't see your whole life, by the way. No one does but God. So I'm not, I don't have the ledger in front of me of what your fruit, you, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. That's up to you and God to know that. I mean, more so God to know that. Yes? Okay. Um, Todd said verse 13 is referring to the New Jerusalem. I thought you said the time frame is taking place during day seven. These verses are really difficult for me to understand the different time frames. Vicki said the day nor the hour in verse 13 is singular. Mm -hmm. The day or the hour he's talking about is, he's talking about the day, or the, the day of his perusia when it's going to be. And the hour, and it, when it's singular, is talking to, again, remember, again, verses 1 to 12 is happening during the millennial reign, what we say day 7. How do I know that? Because it's compared to, we talked before, to the kingdom of the heavens, which takes place in a thousand-year reign. Verse 13 is a retrospect look at the day or the hour, meaning you don't know because the days and hours, plural, speak to the end of tribulation which leads to the day of his millennial reign, which leads to an end of the hour. So because the days and hours lead up to the day, which ends with the hour. And I'll draw it on the board when I'm done so you understand that. But that's what's being talked about and what he's referencing is, we, we don't, you don't know. You, you don't know who you are and you don't know, even if you did know who you were, you're not gonna know these, the, these things. So what you do know is you should be behaving more becoming to your calling, right? And that's what he's getting at. And the reality is that to the time frame, again, from verse 1 to 12 of Matthew 25, it's, it's the perusias. And that goes back to the 
verse 3 of Matthew, Matthew 24 about the third question. So if you're confused on the time frame or concerned about time frame, then I've done something wrong because I, I was trying to not to belabor that too much, but also I wanted to go over it, but maybe I had gone over it frequently enough because it's kind of getting lost and there's a lot of information that we ebb and to and from out of, and I think that's probably causing some of the cloudiness. So I think it's not so much that it's new and different, but also because there's so much information that we move in and out of that it's hard to follow all of that. Todd said, no, it's not you. Okay. Well, I, I can say, so just to remind you, let me go back to, let me just kind of, we're going to, we'll get to an end of our night tonight here as we go back, just to remind you. So if we're going back to chapter 24, verse 3, there's three questions asked, remember? We know that, right? That if you go back into um, those, those events, so when you get into the events of chapter 24, verse 37 to 51, and 25 to, 40, to 146, this is answering the last question. So the time frame of the last question is day seven. It's that simple. So the time frame of the last question, which starts in Matthew 24, verse 37, from that point onward, he's talking about the millennial reign. Sometime earthly, but when he says kingdom of the heavens, that's heavenly. But it's mostly the heavenly perspective. That's what he's talking about. So he's talking about the events that lead into the Perugia, that lead, lead, lead into it, and that happen in it. So that's what he's talking about in this right here. Does that help any? Bob, to remind you about that? Does that help? And if there's, does that help, Todd? And there was also, um, I don't have it. There's a previous study we did where I didn't write it on the board Todd here. said yes. On the, there was a previous study, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, where I wrote on the board uh, that this is the verse that ended the first question. This is the verse that ended the second question that was being asked from the passages in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And I believe I did that at the end of the study when we got to the end of Mark and Luke, I believe I some I, during the study I did it, and at the end I did it again. So there's a there's a demarcation of when the scripture says this, that's the answering that first question. When will these things be? And then when will be the sign of your um, the end of the age? When will this the, the sign of your presence? So those are all answered differently, and I parsed that out from when the verses transition from answering one question to the next. And I believe that was I don't know four lessons ago maybe or something like that but I did do that I'll, I'll have to refine it and I'll highlight it for you yes Pam said I'm visual so the board notes mapped out will totally help okay cool yeah I know it's hard a lot of times so I know that so this is good though that's why I wanted to go over it again because I knew there was a lot of different stuff kind of swirling around um, so I wanted to clarify some things there I hope that I touched on the things that are probably I, I left out the first time. I believe that looking at my notes, I, some things I missed the first time I did touch on this time. So I'm, I'm good at this point, at, at a stopping point, other than I want to make sure, because we're going to go through verse 14 onward on Sunday, I want to make sure that from your side of it, y y you guys are at a good stopping point. So I can tell by today it was a good thing that we went over this again, because I didn't want any sense of like hanging chads, if you will. <laughs> or gnawing at your like splinters in your mind going, oh my gosh, I don't really get, I can't. If you don't have that kind of categorized, then we really can't be moving forward effectively. So what might be good to, to do is um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find the board that I had before where I mapped out where those verses ended and I'll resend that out so you can be reminded or just remind you of the, um, the date that it was done. One and of the Todd two. said, I think this is a good stop for me. Yeah. Yeah, it, it and is. Vicky yep. said, we can stop here. Yeah, it is a good stop for, for this to be at this point. But I just, you know, I, I thought it was just important to really go into that depth of, again, I want to end with one thought about the oil issue again. So the oil out of it is what you, it comes to the hunter fruit, but it, it, it in and of itself doesn't represent the hunter fruit. It's what you need to produce the actual under fruit, which it actually literally represents the presence of, of Christ in your life specific to 
the ministry of his peace and reconciliation in your life that you've taken the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path, the oil, at the same simultaneous time. Out of taking the lamp, out of, I didn't write the book, remember, Ek Lamban, you took out of that the oil, you took Christ. You didn't just, so in other words, I'm with this question to have you thinking about this. And I, I gotta confess my sins. I, I'm, I, got, I can't speak for you. I'm just gonna be the one falling on the sword, being honest. When I first heard about the things that are the seed within a seed, the truth within truth. I did see, I did take the lamp with the oil. However, the more I learned, the more I kept taking the lamp without the oil. That's the truth. So I can be honest with you and tell you that. I'm not proud of it, but it's the truth. It's the truth. I can remember because I, I, cause you, in, 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 I can't speak to you. I can speak just to me. I know honestly to myself when I first we first were given and I first was given it was just a, a different thing it resonated so deeply that it was just a different thing and then it wasn't until I had I, I can honestly say it was 1993 when I took the lamp and the oil and then slowly thereafter from like 97 onward I got lost in the weeds and it wasn't until nine years later roughly 2008 where I kind of resurfaced with taking the oil with the lamp again. I'm just being honest with you, looking back and seeing my own self in a critical, but not, I'm not trying to, but, you know, I'm just being honest about who, who my shortcomings. So I would say that would be, because it's easy to do that. It's easy to just kind of get complacent and you just go, oh, you know, you don't need, you already have, you had past tense and so you lose sight that you don't need it anymore as much, or you don't even, you don't think that way, I didn't think that way, it wasn't consciously, it was subconsciously, like, you just took it for granted, and you don't realize it until later, you don't, it's just, it's hard to explain, and like you, cogn I didn't cognitively say, oh, I'm going to take Christ out of my life, no, it just was, I became so enamored with learning, with the information, that I lost sight of the why behind it all, and, um, and I lost myself, is the truth of it. So, yeah. Okay, first of all, Todd said, uh, when was the last time you set your, out your board notes? Laney said, May 16. Todd said, no notes, Laney, only conversation and video. You didn't get the board? I haven't done that every single week. And Vicki said, I have notes. Laney said, I have a copy of the board. Todd said, Pam, I do, Pam and I do not. We have been erased. What? And Laney said, check spam. That's insane. Yeah, I got to go. I don't, I, I, you're on, you're like the first, because I do it by a, it, that's weird, because I do it by a, um, what is that called, pre-fill thing? And I, because there's so many people's names, I just put in, um, Pam's the first name that comes up all the time. Well, on the pre-filled list, you know, it's always Pam, Todd, then it goes Vicky, Laney, and it's all the Tracy, Vicky. It does, it, I don't even, I don't key your names in. Like it just comes up pre-populated and I just put enter, I just tap, 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 and it goes all in there and I send it. So that's weird because I know, actually, wait a minute, Pam's the first one that comes up and then Todd, yours is toward the end, which is weird. They used to be together and then they're separate when they populate into the system when I'm setting up the who to send it to. Laney said, have you been getting them previously? Yeah, I, don't, I need to know, like, I, need, I didn't know this. So what you're telling me right now is, is, is not good. I need to know, like, I don't understand. Like, how long have you not been getting them exactly? That makes, I, I'm, I'm just confused. That's the first time I didn't understand that at all. So let me know the last time you got one because I can resend them to you. Todd said he's checking. Yeah, let's let me know. So we'll end with this on, on a prayer, and, I, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't know. That would explain a lot. If you don't have those charts and, you, and those boards, you're not going to see what I was talking about. That makes a ton of sense why you're going, we don't know, because you don't have it. <laughs> so just, and, and, and then if you don't get one for the week, just let me know, because I believe I send one out. There's maybe one week I missed, 
but most, I mean, I'd say nine times out of 10, I'm usually sending a board out. You don't get them though. Like I take a picture of the board and I send them in an email to people. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I can, I just, because when I asked you about the devotion, I forgot, so Pam it's online said, though, by the way. Pam said, my last board notes are February 28th. Todd said February 28th for Pam and I. What? And Vicky said, I am looking at my email and Pam's and Todd's name is on it. And Pam said, I, I did get the updated chart email. Lainey said, that is crazy. That's insane. I, you're on the list. And uh, Pam said, but no notes. Robin said, I'm behind, but we'll be working on them. I can tell you that um, the board is always online. So if you go to the pfbcstudies.com website, all the boards are on there. The picture of the boards are all on there. You can, also, you can actually print them from there too, by the way. You can do that. You can actually view them and print them from online site, PFBC studies. They're all on there. They're on there for about a year. And then Vicky they get, said it's in your junk spam folder, probably. It's got to be. Pam said, I do, I do get the lesson each week and Nancy's conversation email. So odd. Yeah, that comes from the email and mine comes from the, I do mine from the phone, from my email. I take a picture and send it so but go online and print those off by the way you'll see by each lesson the picture of the board you can just print them off Todd said Vicki when it says our names is is it listed under the subject Bible study board yep and that's how I send it out so well let, let, let's pray sorry we get off topic here so um, so father we thank you for this day and time we've had an opportunity to study and Help us to uh, continue to trust you and continue to seek you and and help, just be thankful for all the provisions that you've made. Help to clarify all these technology issues we're experiencing and the difficulties with some of these emails and so forth. And But more importantly, Father, we thank you for all your provision and guidance you give to us, your love and certainty of your your purpose you have in our lives and the value you place in us. And that with you, we have a, a priceless uh, opportunity to continue to grow and learn and just understand we are the children of the Most High God, and we thank you so much for being our Father who loves us, who continues to endear and guide and direct us in all our ways. We ask you to be with us through the weekend, bring us back together safe. In Jesus' Yeshua's name we pray, amen. By the way, would you say to those kids outside? Oh, what did I say to them? Oh, can, I, can you repeat I, it? I asked them not to curse, and then I invited them to church. <laughs> oh, did you really? Yeah. <laughs> well, they stopped cursing. <laughs>